During this year's celebration of Women's History Month, Queen's Public Library is celebrating the leadership, strength, and solidarity of women identifying individuals in all walks of life. Be inspired to unleash your power within and make your visions for the future a reality. For upcoming programs, book recommendations, and more, visit queenslib.org forward slash WHM 2023. Tax season is here. Queen's Public Library is partnering with a number of organizations to offer free in-person tax counseling sessions at several QPL locations. Visit our blog at queenslibrary.org for more information. QPL's mobile app now translates to over 90 languages. Check out all the services you can access using our mobile app and its latest features. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android. Download the QPL mobile app today at connect.queenslibrary.org. Welcome to Queen's Public Library's talk with Namwali Serpel, author of The Furrows. New York Magazine declares a triumph, so visceral it leaves the reader breathless. The New Yorker writes, a novel that reclaims and refashions the genre of the elegy, charging it with as much eros as pathos. Time states, with warmth and dexterity, Serpel has crafted a narrative that underscores how loss can show us the depths of our love. LitHub proclaims that Serpel is already earning comparisons to Toni Morrison. The Furrows has been chosen as one of the best books of the year by The New Yorker, Oprah Daily, Time, The Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, The Guardian, Esquire, Vulture, Ms. Magazine, Vox, Mental Floss, Book Page, Kirkus Reviews, and Publishers Weekly. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pink, Huffington Post, Lambda Literary, and have recently co-adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs for Rebel Satori Press. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. My first novel, The Unventionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Marie Media in 2011 and is streaming on Plex, Tubi, and Amazon. My new novel, Performer Non Grata, will be released in April by Rebel Satori Press. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski, and now in its 10th year at the Queen's Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Namwali Serpel was born in Lusaka, Zambia, and lives in New York. She received a 2020 Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize, the 2015 Kane Prize for African Writing, and a 2011 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. Her debut novel, The Old Drift, won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Science Fiction, and the Los Angeles Times' uh, Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction. It was named one of the 100 most notable books of 2019 by the New York Times Book Review and one of Time Magazine's 100 Must Read Books of the Year. Her nonfiction book, Stranger Faces, was a finalist for a National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism. She is currently a professor of English at Harvard. Thank you for joining us so much, Namwali. Thanks so much for having me, Brian, and the Queen's Public Library. It's our pleasure. Um, the Furrows begins with a really heartbreaking and horrific drowning of a young boy named Wayne and the near drowning of his 12-year-old sister, C, who narrates the story. I know it's fiction, but what was it like emotionally or psychologic, psychologically for you to write that really harrowing first chapter? So for me, um, the writing of difficult, violent, painful, traumatic scenes differs 
emotionally, depending on whether it's nonfiction or fiction. Mm -hmm. So when I've written about, for example, my late sister Chisha's death, and that's the person to whom the novel is dedicated mm -hmm. uh, in nonfiction, I found that very difficult and very emotionally affecting. Um, but writing the beginning of The Furrows, which was very much inspired by the grieving process I had with her, didn't strike me as, um, I don't know, wrenching in the same way. Mm -hmm. And part of it, I think, is that the process of mediating or putting layers between me and what's going on, uh, thinking about language, thinking about how it's going to affect the reader, thinking about uh, conveying facts and feeling to another gives me a kind of buffer from mm. the actual intensity of it. I based the opening passage on a dream that I'd had mm. uh, where I was in the water with a little boy and was trying to swim him to shore. In retrospect, only when I published the novel did I realize that that little boy was probably my nephew, Cheza, who is now uh, you know, a college student uh, at Virginia Commonwealth, uh, an English major, um, and is very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. When I woke up from that dream back in 2008, I think is when I had the dream, I felt very much the same kind of anguish that I mm -hmm. felt when I thought about my late sister. And I think there was some kind of tapping of the emotional register of trying to save someone um, and not being able to and feeling kind of responsibility for somebody that I was accessing in my dream life. But when it came down to putting the words on the paper, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> when it came down to putting words on the page, uh, again, that mediation, that process of trying to actually capture it somehow buffered it for me and made it much easier in some ways um, to experience. Does <clears throat> either writing about grief in nonfiction or fiction offer any kind of catharsis? It's a good question. I think that narrativizing the experiences that you've gone through, whether that's in therapy or simply talking to somebody, talking to a friend, even if that friend doesn't have the same experience, there's something about putting in language together uh, an account of what you've gone through that I do think can help process. I don't think it necessarily expunges or purges in the mm -hmm. original sense of, of catharsis. And a lot of what I'm trying to do in the furrows is prevent that final relief mm. or release that is connoted by catharsis. Mm. I'm trying to kind of pull the reader back into that grief over and over again. And so I think in some sense that the, you know, this I'm trying to thwart that release because I think it can be illusory. I think we can sometimes feel like, oh, I've 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 got it all out now. I'm healed. I've gone through all the stages of grief, but that's not been my experience. I think you're doing something really clinically wise uh, in this approach, honestly, um, mm. in, in keeping the reader there rather than allowing them to release or, or, or expunge any of this sort of feeling uh, that stay with you throughout the duration of the book uh, as the teller of the story and, and to, to experience what these characters are experiencing. I feel like it not just only provides a deeper appreciation for the literature, but I think it does something psychologically beneficial for the reader if they stay with you until mm -hmm. the end as well. You said that you had the dream of the opening chapter in 2009. Is that 2008. when you started writing? Yeah, so yeah, so I wrote a first draft of this book alongside writing my first academic book, which I was writing in order to get tenure at the University of California, Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So I had these two books. One is called Seven Modes of Uncertainty, and then I had The Furrows. And so they took me about six years together to draft completely. Mm -hmm. uh, Seven Modes of Uncertainty was published in 2014 and helped me get tenure. And then I've really sort of never looked at it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, The Furrows, I put in a drawer felt like it wasn't quite ready. And I pulled it out of a drawer again in December of 2019 and revised it 
then okay. and made some pretty significant changes, which I'm happy to talk about. So it's this, a lot of my projects have this quality of I start them and then I put them away and then I come back to them. I, I sort of treat them as these kinds of gardens that are I'm letting grow in the background. It's, there's almost like this, um, it's an energy. It pulls you to it when it needs attention, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm very, you know, it's like very comforted by rather than inspired by because I already had this process, but I read somewhere that Edward P. Jones thought about his novel, his magisterial novel, The Known World, for mm -hmm. 12 years before he wrote a single word of it. Wow, that's And incredible. I thought, that makes sense to me. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. It's almost like we spend so much of our lives preparing to write the stories we eventually write without yeah. realizing it. Yeah. I think grief does all sorts of strange things to people. Um, and in your book, C. and Wayne's mother engages in maybe magical thinking. Is it fair to say that? Yeah. Um, please talk a little bit about this and also C.'s perception of it. So the novel stages this drowning, as you described it, as an, as what's called an ambiguous loss because no mm -hmm. body is recovered. Right. And C believes that she witnessed or perceived her brother's death prior to the moment that his body disappeared. Mm -hmm. So when she's swimming him from um, the, the ocean to the shore, she feels the weight on her back shift in a way that makes her feel like he has died. Mm -hmm. And when she gets home, there's a, a figure who has helped her get home, a man in a blue windbreaker, who then leaves, uh, the, drops C at home without her little brother and vanishes from the story. And so the three members of the family that are left see her mother, Charlotte, and her father, Bernard, all have different relationships to what happened. Mm -hmm. C believes that Wayne, her little brother, has died and that his body was dragged out to sea. Her mother, Charlotte, believes that he's gone missing and was perhaps kidnapped by this man and the windbreaker. And C's father, Bernard, isn't sure whether this man had you know, was actually the the culprit actually caused the death of his child. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they, they end up in a kind of impasse as a family. Charlotte's belief, and I think magical thinking is the right way to put it, leads her on a kind of decades long expedition to find her missing son. She creates an organization for missing children. Mm -hmm. And this basically, becomes the vortex that pulls her entire life and C's life into it. C eventually works for the foundation as well. Bernard leaves and starts his own family uh, elsewhere. He's it, There's a kind of rupture in the family that's created by the loss of this child. Yes. Um, if, if you had to sort of s summarize, first I want to say this. I read a lot of studies conducted by psychologists who suggest that fiction, even more than nonfiction, can help us um, develop or, or strengthen our empathy. Mm. Um, and I, I think that The Furrows is a great example of a book that can do that. When we're talking about grief and loss, if you had to sort of, I hate when I have to do this, when people ask me to do this, but I'm going to mm. ask you, okay. you, would you, would you be able to say what the novel says about grief and loss as a thematic statement? Well, I think, you know, I've, I've actually written a piece very sort of vehemently contesting the idea that fiction produces empathy in us, Interesting. partly because of my sense that as a reader, you're being with or identifying with or feeling with or having compassion for a character is a very complicated but very different thing from mm -hmm. when we empathize with people in our actual lives. Right. When it comes to whether we act on their behalf, right? You can't help a character, you right. can help a person, right? Sure. When it comes to whether or not that empathy is motivated by selfishness, um, I, I just wanna keep reading this story. This is really delightful. So we have we have a lot of fun, for example, empathizing with murderers and you sure. know, horrible people in fiction, but we would never do that in real life. So, right. so in any case, 
in the furrows, I think my effort is to try to put you in the position of different characters who are all experiencing grief in very different ways. So one of the things that my novel is trying to say about grief, because I think there are many, mm -hmm. is that we all experience it very differently yes. and that there's no right way to mourn. I think, as you say, grief does really terrible things to all of us. And you mentioned Charlotte as an example of that, because she does end up kind of perpetuating a delusion that takes over her life for a very long time. Yeah. But C is also really distorted by grief to the extent that she even projects, I think, a, a kind of false um, identification of a man that she meets as her long lost brother and yes. then falls in love with him, which yeah. has you know, in, incestuous implications. It, it's not actually her brother, but the fact that she could feel that, that she could even tempt that thought, suggests just how much grief has really messed her up too. I thought that was fascinating. We're gonna talk about that in a little while. Um, sure. What kind of research did you do uh, in preparation mm -hmm. for the novel? I didn't do very much, to be honest. I think um, my first novel, The Old Drift, is mm -hmm. a story of Zambia, which is my home country. And it takes place over the course of a century and a half, goes into the near future, becomes science fiction. So I had to do a lot of science research and historical research for that novel. For The Furrows, a lot of what I was doing in terms of research was reading and rereading the influences of for the novel, watching and rewatching films that were really important. So I was reading and rereading Virginia Woolf, who's mm -hmm. Novel to the Lighthouse is very lies very much um, at, at the back of this book. She once thought that that novel should be called an elegy, and that's uh, my my subtitle is an elegy. An elegy, yeah. And I was watching and rewatching a lot of Hitchcock, who becomes very important in the second half of the novel. So yeah. Vertigo, in particular, um, and the, the notion of doubles. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of, and, and I was reading Walter Mosley, I was reading Chester Himes, I was reading James Keane is a really big influence uh, on, on the noir side of the book. Um, Edgar Allan Poe as well um, is very important. He wrote the first doppelganger story in English called William Wilson, or so yeah, William Wilson, and that's uh, really important to the second half of the book. Um, I did some research on ambiguous loss, um, which is the kind of psychological theory um, uh, around what happens when you are grieving without a body, which is something that many, many people experienced during the pandemic, actually, because they weren't allowed to go to the grave sites or to the funerals of their loved ones. Um, and it's, I think um, someone wrote a, a whole book about this quite recently, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but um, I'll, I'll look for it. I was also looking at um, theories, uh, psychological theories about what loss can do to families, especially families that are separated at an early age. Um, but that was barely research, it's more that I stumbled across some articles and then followed a thread. Something else you do that really uh, impressed me was you, you meditate on mortality. Mm. You I think, and, and quite vividly. Mm -hmm. um, how did you decide to approach it, that aspect of the storytelling? I think I was interested in a specific experience of loss that I had encountered um, in others and that I myself had, had felt which was the ways that the human mind resists the fact of death. Yeah. And so I, I to, you know, I, I'm not a believer in ghosts as a, as a manifest physical reality, only because I've never seen them. But I do think they very much are a manifestation of mourning. You, it's, it's the desire to see the loved one back, right? And so it's very often someone who's died coming into your home which is a family member and they're coming into the space where they once were. And for me, it very much manifested in the forms of dreams. I would dream that my late sister was still alive. She would say, I've gone on a trip somewhere. Um, that's why I've been away. And you know, the dreams would recur and she kept trying to convince me that she was still alive. And then I would wake up to the fact of her dead again. And 
I've talked to several people who've had the same experiences, the author Honoré um, Fanon Jeffers I, and, and I were just talking about it the other day at uh, AWP. Um, my colleague, Stephen Greenblatt, gave me a similar story about his father. Um, it's it's a strange way that, uh, and, and the, the, the epigraph to my novel, um, Proust talks about this. Um, he says, you know, when someone has died, it's as though they've gone away on a trip. Um, they, they haven't really died for us. Yeah. And so my effort in the novel was to try to enact that experience for the reader, not just describe it, which I do to a certain extent because he has dreams of Wayne, but to actually enact that feeling of reunion in the dream and then this devastating loss once again, falling yeah. right on top of it. And so the, repeti the repetitive structure of the novel, C loses Wayne in three different ways, three different times, and reunites with him in the, the form of this man that she keeps meeting three different ways, three different times, in order to stage that feeling of uh, the way we feel about death or, or refuse really to acknowledge death. I, I thought that that structure, that sort of recurring structure was very interesting on some level. It's very Hitchcockian, yes, but also even a little mm -hmm. bit Freudian, <laughs> which I thought was kind of fascinating. Repetition, and, compulsion, and, yes. com repetition <laughs> compulsion, completely <laughs> unexpected and really narratively thrilling. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's something accurate too about what you said regarding death. You know, my dad died eight years ago before mm -hmm. he Sorry. met my husband who I married uh, just a couple of years ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have dreams all the time about him discussing mm. my husband with me in my dreams mm. and yeah. you know the conversations we would have had right yeah like, had, i mean that's that's, a, that's sort of beautiful way that it can happen right where my mom used to talk about ha dreaming about her mother and they would garden together completely mm. silently they would just sit next to each other and garden and my i've had dreams about my mother who's since passed where and there's no sense of panic there's no trying to convince me she's still alive it's just simply um my sister calls it a visit you know she's come to visit and that that can be so healing and so wonderful i yeah. deny my I deny my characters that um, entirely in this novel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you 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 know you you're very Nabokovian in that you make them duly suffer, right? And so <laughs> <laughs> you put them through their paces. Um, you explore biracial identity in really thoughtful and probing ways. C is biracial. What are her feelings about being both black and white? So maybe some of the insights. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of insights, but what are some yeah. you can maybe share? Yeah, um, you know, it's one of these. Um, again, kind of red herrings about uh, writing about things that you have experienced is that um, people will identify me with C because I am also a mixed race, but we have a very different biracial experience. And one of the things that I've tried to do in both of my novels is again, kind of um, multiply our sense of these experiences because in The Old Drift, there are several biracial characters, but some are Indian and Italian, some are Black Zambian and White Zambian, but some are men, some are women. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are the children born of two mixed race people, which in Zambia are called coloreds, which is not a mm -hmm. word you can use in America at all, um, but it's a very specific racial category and it means you have a long history of uh, mixed race parentage um, for a very long time. And they all have very different resonances and very different political implications depending on where you're from and where you grow up. So just to briefly describe my experience, I was born to a black Zambian mother and a British Zambian father. He was white and she was black. And we moved from Lusaka, where I grew up until I was nine, um, in, to Baltimore in 1989. And to the same uh, neighborhood that I, I describe um, Cassandra living in or C living in, although it's a very, they're, like they're, there's no school called St. Anne's there. It's very different. The, the street names are very different, but I just kept the name Pikesville, the suburb there. She is born to an African-American father and a white American mother. Mm -hmm. And she, I think, has a, an experience of being very much caught between two parents that aren't very um, explicit or even vocal about the fact that they're in a mixed race relationship, which is very different from my parents who 
talked about race all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she experiences an extra sense of alienation from the black side of her family when her brother dies and when her father leaves, because she no longer has access to that side of the family. Right. She barely has access to him. Right. So in a lot of ways, I think C is struggling with how to uh, place herself within a, a majority white world, which is her mother's world, the world of her school, the world of the college she goes to, and um, and even her, her work life. And this means that she has, um, I think, a kind of alienation, um, a sense of alienation without the comfort of community mm -hmm. um, that I think resonates with certain characters in African-American literary history, um, like uh, Claire in Nella Larson's Passing, who has chosen to pass as white, yeah. um, or the autobiography of an ex-colored man, the, the ex-colored man in James Weldon Johnson's novel about uh, racial passing, um, who again is, is constantly toggling between two worlds and doesn't quite know where to fit. So I think she has a much more alienated sense of her racial identity than the man that she meets and ends up in a, a relationship with, uh, Wayne, who has grown up Black and has um, had a very, very difficult experience, but has a kind of sense of um, his racial identity that is not quite as um, tenterhook or teeter-tottering between worlds. I think that's, you know, I, I'll, I'm going to get to something in a little bit. I want to ask a couple more questions before I start talking about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you begin your novel with the line, I don't want to tell you what happened. I want to tell you how it felt. And you do. You very, very viscerally depict a, a drowning, a car accident, an explosion. The writing is really corporeal. How important is it to put the reader in the body of the characters hmm. for the sake of sensation or relatability? I think it's what fiction does. You know, I think it, if we if we experience fiction without access to that corporeality, it feels like we're watching something. It feels like we're mm -hmm. at, at a distance. And that's, you know, film is wonderful at that. And so I sort of feel like fiction doesn't need to do that. Fiction should do what it's best at, which is getting into the consciousness and bodies um, of other people. So it's very important to me, um, the, the body, the, the sense of a body in a world is I think uh, one of the most, challenging but also interesting parts of being a writer, of being a fiction writer. I've, I've read an interview with Mary Gateskill a couple of years ago, and she said that when she was working with her students, her greatest challenge was to get them to do that, that mm. thing, put, put the yeah. reader in the body of your characters. What does it feel like for them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so again, getting back to trauma and its relationship to memory, we haven't spoken about that yet. Memory yeah, yeah. is highly unreliable, as we all know, even though it yeah. always feels so accurate and precise to us yeah. when we recall especially traumatic events. Um, what does your novel say about memory and its function and mm -hmm. maybe maybe healing? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it ties back to this question of embodiment because C is an unreliable narrator. Right. You know, from, familiar to us from, from the history of literature. But one of the ways that I make the reader believe what she has to say, only to kind of upend that uh, or pull the rug out from under the reader, because it's a first person um, narrative, is by putting us in her body. So when she feels Wayne die, it's, a, I, it's not that she thinks it, it's not that she perceives it and, you know, with her eyes, or it's really like it's a, it's a haptic, it's a bodily feeling. And it's only by doing that, that I can really um, help the reader understand just how strong this belief is for her. It's, a, it's something she has felt in her body. And then when I say, well, but Charlotte says that he didn't die, um, then the reader is, I think, thrown into this space of, of uncertainty, but it's much more uh, visceral. It's much harder to, to have skepticism about C's experience because we have felt it. And I would say that that's the same thing that memory is like. Right? So yeah. we and and I feel very much that dreams are this way too. There's it's very hard to 
cast doubt on your own memory of something. Right. Someone else can. Sure. And maybe and sometimes you, you'll look at your diary and you'll say, wait, <laughs> that's not what I remember. And so sometimes you can even, you know, contest your own experience. But memory is so concrete and it's so perceptual that it, it's actually very difficult to dislodge. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, in the way we were talking about earlier, the way our dreams can be this respite where we get to experience being with those that we can't be with in real life. I think memory has a similar function, right? It's a way of being with people, even if it's not actually there. Um, in Cassandra's case, that becomes, takes on kind of a delusional quality because she's remembering things that contradict other memories that she's had. And so the reader is left wondering, well, how did this child disappear? How did her brother die or not die? Is it is she remembering the wrong thing? But part of what she's doing is that by remembering, she gets to keep him with her, right? Even though he's gone. I think, you know, I, I know neuroscience, not neuroscientists have been writing about the unreliability of memory in that. The more we tend to remember the the difficult memories, the less mm. reliable they become because we start mm. writing over them like a palimpsest, sort of yeah. palimpsest. Uh, so it starts to become less and less reliable the more we dwell on it. Yeah. Um, C seems haunted and even hounded by Wayne, um, her her dead brother, her possibly dead brother. You know, you never make yeah. you know perhaps make it clear. Can you talk a little bit about percep her perception of him? and the appearances as she sometimes imagines. Yeah, so I have um, Wayne appeared to her in different forms. So he comes to her in her, in her dreams, in his, mm -hmm. um, in his baby self. He was seven when, when he went missing um, uh, or, or died. Um, I have him appear in the form of a kind of sandy boy. That's kind of, mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like a golem. Um, it's, it crumbles um, when it looks, when it smiles at her. So it's sort of a hollow uh, sand based um, creature. And so that's partly a function of her mind riffing on seeing his body covered in sand when she buried him and on the mm -hmm. beach the day that he mm -hmm. first went missing. Um, and then I have this sense that as she gets older and starts to take on some of her mother's delusion that he's still alive, um, she starts to see him everywhere in strangers that she sees on the subway um, and eventually projects a sense of him onto a man who has the same name, um, whose name is also Wayne. And so she sort of recognizes him uh, in that sense. Uh, so there's there are these different forms um, through which he appears to her. And there's a, a slight nod in that to my feeling that sometimes it's not just that, you know, I'll hear my late sister's voice, but sometimes I'll see um, uh, a ring that she had on someone else's finger, or I'll see a lipstick shade that she loved on someone else, or I'll hear, you know, her favorite songs. Ways that the, the dead can sort of still be with us in, in a very literal sense in these kind of yeah. fragments um, of other people. Staying on this topic for a moment, um, the model of grief for the past several decades has been centered on a very Western one devised by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the five stages of grief, of course, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But you've kind of reimagined the sequence as something non-linear. Uh, mm -hmm. and perhaps very specific, as we said earlier, to each person. How did you arrive at this? I mean, I think just from my experience, it's, 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 these stages never really happened in order. And I think she says as much. I think she says it's not, it's not a progression sure. or a teleology, but it did feel to me that the word stages implies that you go through it um, and that you go through that stage once. And I find, you know, I find that the process of grieving means that I can be, I can go back to feeling really angry. I can yeah. go back to feeling acceptance, you know, there's, and so that kind of, um, yeah, it the, just, it's ineffectuality for my own life, I think made me feel <laughs> like I wanted to uh, just, you know, portray um, my experience uh, of grief in the hopes that it would resonate with other people's experience. It's mm. it's fiction, so it's not really a theory, um, right. and I, I would I would never 
um, say that her theory is is wrong, just that it didn't work for me and it didn't apply to to um, to my life. Um, yeah, I, but I think the most important thing for me was uh, to offer a way of thinking about grief that didn't try to, that neither pathologized it nor tried to fix it um, or try to uh, yeah, heal it in, in both a medical sense and a, a psychological sense. I think that's really bold because I feel like there's so much pressure to have that yeah. knee-jerk response of either pathologize it and then fix it. Uh, yeah. It's hard to not do either. Um, yeah. Good. But I do think I do think it, you know staying staying with it. I had I, I, I we were uh, talking before the show about um, Wasu, whose nonfiction mm -hmm. book Stay True is also a book about mourning, yes. and it's a, a true story about him uh, trying to mourn his his best friend from college. And it's it, it was really it's been really interesting to see him through the process of his book tour. Um, I was so happy to see him um, accept his award for the National Book Critics Circle Award just last night. Yeah. And he, the speech that he gave had clearly been sort of notes had been jotted down in a journal that he's been keeping since his friend died years and years ago. Yeah. And there was a sense of, of, of ongoingness and also of, he, he said, I just wanted to keep hanging out with him. Yes. And so that's why I wrote this. And I think the more that, and anyway, we did an event together at the 92nd street Y. And one of the questions was you both have written about grief and you've both experienced it in your lives. What, what can you, teach us like what can you tell us about how to do this how to get through this and um the only thing that i could say was being with wa on stage being with everybody in the audience several of whom told us their stories in the q a was the only thing that i knew which is that we can be with each other in grief and we can put it in words but it's not like it's going to solve something it's right. just it's just a way of being together um, in something that I think is indelible. We all suffer grief at some point in our lives. Yeah, yeah. it's unavoidable. Um, now, Molly, would you mind reading an excerpt from the furrows? Sure. I'm, I was thinking I uh, would read from the beginning, but um, now I'm wondering if I might read from a passage that's... Uh, where C is in the metro, just because it talks, it, it gives a bit more detail to the question um, that you asked earlier about her mixed race identity. Um, but let me see if I can find it. Um, oh, I, I don't think I can find it on my on my screen. So I'll just read from the beginning. Okay, <laughs> okay. We'll go back to plan A. Okay. All right. I don't want to tell you what happened. I want to tell you how it felt. When I was 12, my little brother drowned. He was seven. I was with him. I swam him to shore. His arms were wrapped around my neck from behind, his chest on my back his knees pummeling my thighs. At first, his small, heavy head was on my shoulder, and he breathed in my ear the occasional snort when water came in. His head bounced. My shoulder ached. His hands were knotted at my collarbone, and I held them there with my hand, both so that he wouldn't let go and so that he wouldn't choke me. With my other hand, I pushed the water away. We had gone to the beach for the day, just the two of us, alone together. This was allowed. This was our whole summer. Our family lived in Baltimore, or in the suburbs, really, a place called Pikesville. When June came and set us free from school and set my father free from his job teaching chemical engineering at Catonsville Community College, my mother was a painter, so she was always free. We would drive three hours down to Delaware to a town near Bethany Beach, where every year we rented the same narrow gray house with a skew porch out front. Every morning after breakfast and cartoons, my brother and I would leave our father to edit his articles and our mother to dab at her paintings. Wayne and I would change into our still damp swimsuits and I would pack us Capri Suns and Lunchables from the fridge. 
We'd walk along the roads, cutting through a gap between the fancier houses to reach the beach. My mother had told us that the gap was called No Man's Land, which Wayne misheard and took to mean it belonged to a man named Norman. We'd sneak quietly through Norman's Land, then tromp over the boardwalk, our flip-flops knocking against it, and find our favorite spot on the shore, which was marked by clumps of seagrass. Wayne was a nutty brown, a scrawny creature, a good kid. He played so hard, as if play were work. I was too old to play, so I watched him play and helped sometimes. That day, I buried him for fun's sake. We dug a shallow trench with cupped hands, like dogs, like gardeners. The top sand was cane sugar, the under sand was brown sugar. When the trench was big enough, he tumbled into it, and I packed the sand onto his body, pat patting it over his hands and over his bony knees. Under the fluorescent sun, he lay still as a magician's assistant. After a while, I walked away from his buried body, staggered off into the sand pockets toward the greenish sea. My toes were already wet by the time he realized I was gone. He leapt up and tossed the hat and gangled his way toward me, yelling pell-mell, splumishing past me into the water. I watched his bronze back vanish, then retreated and sat beside the empty trench with my arms around my knees. There was no one else around. It was bright and hot, the end of summer. Then the clouds came and lowered. The wind rose. The waves rose. Dear Wayne, you swam into the furrows. At first you didn't know it because you were under the surface and you faced down as you swam, staring at the vault of the sea below. Then you felt the sky darken above you, a shadow passing. And when you came up to breathe, you were suddenly inside them, the great grooves in the water, the furrows. On either side of you, those whirring sheets of water, the foam along their edges sharpening like teeth. On either side of you, the furrows chewing, cleaving deeper. They ate you up. You were alone out there, and the world took you back in, reclaimed you into its endless folding. Thank you. Uh, beautiful and horrifying, just really incredible. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, at the midway point of your novel, the voice and the perspective shifts, as we alluded to earlier. Uh, Will emerges after, I think I could, this is not a spoiler, should I try to avoid this? No. I, I, okay, Will avoids. Well, well, there's, I, yeah, go uh, ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, Will emerges after he has sex with C and begins narrating the story as he believes that Wayne is possibly alive, but just missing. Um, I think it's a really exciting and inspired decision that is so much about phenomenology. Mm -hmm. um, when I, I interviewed Zadie Smith a few years ago, she told me that uh, the thing that she loved most about writing fiction was the ability to engage in creative voyeurism, uh, <laughs> to experience the world through the eyes of someone else, a character that is very different from yourself. And then Fran yeah. Leibovitz also affirmed this when she said that literature is more of a window than a mirror. Um, how did you go about accessing the point of view of Will, uh, a man? Uh, this explores kind of non-binary and elastic thinking, uh, I think, on some level. Yeah. So um, what I was going to clarify is um, yes. something that is an understandable reading of the novel, um, but I, it's often it makes it harder to talk about. So there are two men in the second half of the novel. There's a man named Wayne who C meets, and then there's a man named Will, or who calls himself Will, who is narrating from prison. And it's actually two different people. But okay. very often people think they're the same person. I think I conflated them more than once. So I have to go back and yeah, read. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. and I think that's my point because there's supposed okay. to be doppelgangers. So, you okay. know, there's, there's, right. there's a sense that they are doubles. Um, but I'll talk about uh, Wayne because he was the character that came to me first. Mm -hmm. And so he's the adult man that C meets and projects this identity of her uh, baby brother onto and then perversely um, has a sexual relationship with. Mm -hmm. uh, Wayne um, came to me first through this kind of, um, sometimes it's so hard to explain how uh, fiction comes to you when you're writing. Um, yeah. I had written the first half of the book and I'd had these encounters with this man who uh, uh, CCs, um, at a diner um, or at a, a, a cafe um, in the airport in an airplane. And I woke up one morning, I was living in California at the time. 
and I know exactly what where I was looking at the the light on the wall, lying there in bed, and I I just realized that what ha needed to happen next, the only way we could get out of this kind of really claustrophobic um, experience of trauma that has C repeating over and over the loss of her brother and this reunion with a possible um, avatar for him was to switch into his perspective and to wonder, well, why, why is he there? Why, why is he looking? Because it's very clear that he's not just a stranger. He's very uh, interested in talking to C and what, is, what does he want from her? And uh, I decided that he was looking for her little brother um, and was looking for a, a, a man named Wayne. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they were both seeking the same thing. Um, and he was he's looking for, for this man, um, assuming because her mother Charlotte has a missing kids foundation, that he didn't die, but is somewhere out there in the world and that and has actually um, kind of caused some some big trouble for uh, Wayne in his own life. And so that was when I started thinking a lot about my already extant obsession with noir, um, mm -hmm. with Vertigo, with uh, James Cain, and, and so on and so forth, and started rereading those books to try to get a sense of um, that, that spirit of uh, noir or crime fiction that's interested in questions of phenomenology, as you mentioned, questions of ontology, the, the notion of the double. If you think about Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground yes. um, or yeah. even uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, there's always like a criminality kind of hovering over this. Yes. And so I went from this kind of very Virginia Woolf modernist exploration of grief and the kind of family saga. And I was like, I want to go directly into a, a, a neo-noir. <laughs> um, so yeah. wild and unexpected and really thrilling. <laughs> it really is, Namali. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was where Wayne came from. And then in, in, in terms of, so the big revision that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you know, I wrote a draft of the book uh, from 2008 to 2014, put it in a drawer. When I took it out in 2019, the major revision I made was to turn the entire book into the first person. So it had been a third person, but sort of focused through, focalized through Cassandra in the first half and then Wayne in the second half. And I decided I was going to really try to radically um, immerse myself in these two characters for, for C, because that would allow me to um, uh, intensify the unreliability. Because if you have an I speaking to you, I don't want to tell you what happened, then you, you're right. more likely to believe her. Um, and in his case, I think also to kind of um, elevate the mystery of it. But of course, this then created, as you say, this challenge of thinking outside of my gender, outside of my experience, which is generally true for every character that you write. You know, yeah. it's always someone different from you. Yeah. But, but, you know, it, having a different body from a, a, a male body um, is quite difficult. And you know, he speaks uh, as best as I could render in black speech from, you know, someone who has spent most of his time in California, whereas Will, who's writing from prison, um, I was trying to capture black speech from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And he's, and it's a rougher voice. It's a, it's, you know, he hasn't had as much education um, and he hasn't had um, uh, an, an easy life of it uh, either, but it's been, even harder, I think, than um, than Wayne's. So trying to get their voices was actually the hardest thing. I think more so than their bodily experiences. Um, Wayne spends time on the street trying to figure out what it feels like to be homeless, um, what it right. feels like to, what kinds of friendships are available to you, what kinds of relationships. Um, and with uh, with Will, you know, trying to figure out what it feels like to to be incarcerated. Um, those were very very challenging. Um, I, again, my research there, I, a lot of reading, but I also interviewed um, uh, a private investigator, um, oh. a friend of mine who is also a wonderful crime fiction writer, um, uh, and uh, you know, to, just to find out like the, the kind of legal things that would happen at the sure. end of the novel. Right. Um, so yeah, so that that I think, and then you know. I, I talked to black men and I tried to get black men to read 
the, those parts of the book to to give me a sense of where things didn't seem right or didn't work. Um, I remember very specifically tr trying to uh, understand how Wayne would react to C's kind of hysterical, uh, emotional reaction to when her grandmother dies mm. and trying to figure out how a, a man that I think is, is, you know, has a lot of empathy for that, but is also resistant to vulnerability, how he yeah. would deal with her in that kind of situation. So that was, that was very, again, really interesting to me. It's really um, to, to explore what it's like to be another person reacting to um, yet another character that I've created. I think you said it before, this is why we write fiction so that we could do these sort of things, explore these kinds of feelings and perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. To that point, you hold a doctorate in American and British history from Harvard, is that correct? Oh, not history, literature. Literature, okay, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. In what ways does holding a PhD inform your fiction writing specifically? Do you think I mean, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you think it changes it in any way? Because it's, well, it's so oriented toward academic writing? I mean, I think this is, it's one of the great challenges of my life is to try to set up dams or, or walls or boundaries between the, I mean, she's and sheaves of academic prose that I have ingested as a, yes. as a PhD student and as a professor um, from my own prose. And I remember specifically trying to, I was, I was um, back in Cambridge uh, at, um, at Harvard, I, I was, this is when I was still an assistant professor at Berkeley and I was writing the first, but I was back in Cambridge and I was at a coffee shop and I'd, I just had a meeting with a student and I think I'd had meetings with colleagues earlier that day. And uh, I'd started to, to try to work on the novel and I found myself writing like an analysis of the scene instead of writing mm. the scene. And I was like, oh no, I gotta, I gotta get away from this. And it's, I don't think I've completely shed that, you know, that quality of prose um, from my writing. But, you know, I take heart in thinking about some of the writers I admire the most, like Henry James or Virginia Woolf, who were also critics as well as writers. Right. And, yes. um, and I and I try very much to um, follow in their and Morrison too. Toni Morrison is yes. a huge oh, yeah. influence for me because um, and she wrote both criticism and and fiction. And when I taught her recently, I revisited *The Bluest Eye*, and which is her first novel. And I, right. I could see that same um, tick of analysis emerge, like in the middle of a sentence. You know, it's like, and I, I just knew in my spirit that if Morrison had edited th that book 10, 20 years later, she would have taken that clause out. Um, you know, it's, but she was coming from having been a professor for a long time, having sure. been an editor for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, t I try to, you know, understand other, other writers have gone through this before, which is um, trying to, to balance these, these modalities. Um, but I, I think that the one difference that I'm glad that it makes and that I'm not constantly trying to push away is that I had the opportunity in my life to be paid, not very much money, but to be paid enough to live on while all I was doing was reading. Yeah, I was writing yeah. some, yeah. writing papers and, you know, I did some teaching as a graduate student, but sure. really like I've read a lot and I've read more than most people ever have the time to, um, just because I got a PhD. And I think for me, that's been invaluable. Oh yeah, I mean, I only have a master's, but I fantasize every year about going back for my doctorate. And yeah. I do also have that impulse to over analyze and dissect as I'm writing fiction. And I've had editors in the past yell at me and say, stop dissecting. This is not yeah. scholarship. Get back yeah. to just telling the story. So yeah. that's, I have to always be pulled back because my inclination is to explain or to analyze. So I yeah. get that. That's interesting. We're going to be taking questions from Namwali uh, in a few minutes. So please do start sending them in. I have a few left of my own uh, while we wait. Um, what are your thoughts on contemporary fiction? Well, I, I, ha That's a I read a lot. Yeah. No, no, but it's, it's, it's an apt one. Um, I read a lot of it for my job. Um, 
because when you're a writer, you're often asked to read other writers' work, mm -hmm. but also a lot of my friends are writers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm reading their work uh, sometimes to edit, sometimes to give a blurb, um, sometimes to, to do it, this kind of conversation that you're doing. Um, and so I, I'm, I feel like I have, I encounter a great range and I, I because I also do write criticism, but not in an academic sense. I write for the New Yorker or the New York right. Review of Books. Um, I, I sometimes I'm writing a review of contemporary fiction. So I have uh, a piece that I'm working on right now, actually about gender and style, as we were discussing earlier, um, that looks at, I've, I think I've read about 12, you know, recent contemporary works by young women um, in the last two months. But at the same time, I also have been reading um, advanced reader copies of um, works by really amazing um you know, and, and long-standing authors like Jonathan Lethem or Neil Mukherjee um, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I get, I get, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful advantage of, of being a writer. I also worked on contemporary fiction um, in writing that book, Seven Modes of Uncertainty that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, my academic book. My purview was mostly 20th century works, but almost entirely um, post-1950. And uh, at least half of them were post 2000. Um, so I was also doing a lot of research um, on contemporary literature. So I mean, I, mean, I, I wouldn't say that there is a, a theme the way that you could say, well, if you're a modernist, you can talk about, you know, yeah, the standout right. authors and the standout, like what, what it was that they were doing. So many people are doing such different things with yeah. the novel forum. Um, so it's very exciting. I think, you know, there's a big trend toward autofiction, writing about, um, mm -hmm. you know, or that seems to be about one's own life. Right. I tend to, I tend not to write that sort of thing. Um, and there's a lot of interest in genre fiction right now. I do tend to write that. Um, the old, fic the old drift is, has a lot of genre fiction as well. Um, science, science fiction, fiction. Yeah. Um, magical realism, and obviously in the furrows noir, and mm -hmm. um, I'm very excited by experiments with these genres um, by Jonathan Lethem or by Carmen Marie Machado, for example. Oh, um, I love her book. Yeah, that was so good. Yeah, yeah. In the Dream House. Yeah. I, yeah I, 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 I love when writers, I love when liter so called, you know, literary writers incorporate elements of genre. I think that it's yeah. the, the result is a, a very exciting cocktail. We, um, we have a question. Sure. Thank you for this fascinating book and literary discussion, Ms. Serpel. Can you speak a bit about the current rash of book bans in the U.S.? How are we to address the situation and defend the right to read? Well, it's it's devastating. It's horrifying. Um, Toni Morrison's works have been banned for a very long time, and yeah. she uh, essentially compared it to a kind of genocide, like a kind of murder. Um, yeah. It's, it's, you know, we often say the fact that they go after the books first just indicates how powerful books are, which is very stirring and very true, but it doesn't actually help us with the practical situation as you describe it. It's, I think, our responsibilities as writers not to capitulate to the intimidation. I think it's our responsibility to be as much as possible in conversation with and in support of the institutions that are precisely why we have books, which is to say the libraries, um, the Queens mm -hmm. Public Library, um, obviously, um, but also institutions like universities, institutions like you know the, the publishing industry as such, um, institutions like Penn, you know, yes. and and it might seem like well, you know is donating to pen the, the and I don't mean that but going to the pen you know gala or to the, mm -hmm. the the various literary festivals that are around us I think not taking for granted that these literary events that are so much part of our life here in New York for example are going to be here forever we actually have mm -hmm. to support them with our presence we have to we have to go yes. we have to be yes. there um, be members of um, not necessarily put money into but just put our time and, and investment yes. into and I also think it's really important to, um, in the way that we talk to young people about literature, 
there's been an ethos for a long time, and I won't attribute it to anyone in particular, but there's been an ethos for a long time that it doesn't matter what kids are reading as long as they're reading. Hmm. And I just don't think that's true. Hmm. And I think what we're going to see if these bans keep happening is that what's left for children to read are going to be extremely reactionary, conservative, yeah. And boring and not mm -hmm. particularly intellectually stimulating <laughs> or interesting. And so we have to actually protect our what we value in literature. You know what I mean? Not just like books as such, but like all the books and all the good books. Right. Um, and, yeah. and so that that's what I would say as um, my my polemic about that. Um, we're doing all that we can, but you know, a, a lot of this is is political work that's outside the purview of me as a writer, and that's more in my purview as a citizen, which has to do with voting and has to do with, um, you know, writing uh, as much as I can, you know, uh, the kinds of essays um, that can affect public opinion, right? We, uh, we can't be complacent, right? We have to be active. We can't be passive yeah. about it. Um, Namal Namali, what are you working? I know you just, this book was just released. So what do you, <laughs> you have a next project lined up? <laughs> I do. I mean, I mentioned earlier that I, I, I have all these books that are like these gardens. And so I have, you know, five books in my imagined, uh, universe. Um, mm -hmm. and now two of them, now that two of them have been published, I think I still have five. So I guess I had seven. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I've been, um, thinking about, um, another novel, which is uh, hopefully a little bit less diff you know, difficult emotionally to read. Um, it's more of a, a comedic family drama um, and that revolves around um, birth rather than death. Oh, okay. And I'm also working on that essay about gender and style that I mentioned. And I'm thinking about um, working on some, uh, like a longer nonfiction book about Toni Morrison as well. Great. Oh, that, that'll be exciting for sure. I'm sorry, we have one more question, two more questions coming in. Oh, sure, sure. Um, thank you. For, well, this is a statement. Thank you for a most enjoyable and informative program, Namwali. Your writing sounds wonderful, and I will be exploring your books. Thank you, Eileen. Oh, thank and you, Eileen. A question. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I have so many questions. I'll stick to just one. Can you speak a little bit more about your experimentation with form and confluence of genres in the old drift? I'd be happy to. Um, so The Old Drift, as I mentioned earlier, um, spans a century and a half, and it starts on the banks of the Zambezi River near the Victoria Falls mm -hmm. in um, what was then known as Northern Rhodesia and eventually became my country, Zambia. And in that sense, it's sort of historical fiction because it starts there and it moves us through independence in 1964 to the present moment and then into the near future. I first started writing that book in college. So speaking of books that <laughs> take their time. Um, yeah, to, to, just to yeah. I was uh, 20 when I first started writing that book and the characters that I came up with first appeared to me in different genres, even though they were three different members of the same family. So I had this w grandmother who was crying all the time. She was this crying woman. She had a daughter who in response to her mother's crying, which she believed was from heartbreak, became very cynical and um, ended up kind of growing up a little too fast and became a sex worker. Hmm. And so it's very much like a realist novel and then, or, or story. And then her son, um, Jacob became, it uh, came to me as a, a boy who was obsessed with flying things. Um, so planes and helicopters, but as time went on, that became drones and micro drones that are the size of mosquitoes, these tiny. And so all three of them were part of the same family, but they, and I think my brain maybe was punning on generation and genre, which are actually etymologically related. But mm -hmm. I, I had the sense that I wanted. And I remember when I first um, talked to um, other students in the class about these characters, they were very confused, first of all, that I had these uh, contemporary references in relationship to Zambia. 
they were like, why is the crying woman crying into Coke bottles? You have those there? I was like, yes, we do. <laughs> but also how could they, how could these different characters from different genres exist on the same plane? So a lot of my effort in that book was to try to make the, the fact that they existed on the same plane have a kind of logic to it and not feel disruptive, but feel continuous. I started that in 2000, you know, then I got to read in 2004, David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, which moves yeah. through multiple genres over time. Mm -hmm. Then Jennifer Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad, which also, yeah. right? And so, and even Gino Diaz and um, uh, Oscar Wow, and even Oscar White wow. Teeth when, when yeah. I read visited it um, actually has a science fictional ending, you know, so it's got yeah. historical. Yeah. And so it's like, and which I hadn't, I think I must have like absorbed that because that book was very influential on the family structure, but I didn't realize it was influential on the genre structure until much later. So I had these com like compadres in the genre <laughs> playing game. And, um, and I really, it, it was, it was so much fun, I think, to fully commit I remember when I was writing the magical realist portion of the novel, it starts with a woman who's covered in hair. And my editors were like, the prose is so Baroque and entangled. And I was like, yes, because she's covered in hair. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, really in, like, it calls the for it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, the most but then when I got to the science fiction part, I could like have, you know, snappy dialogue and like technical descriptions. Um, so I really delighted in being able to play with the genres that had been so um, inspirational for me. I, you know, you mentioned earlier, you like when literary writers play with genre and it's mm -hmm. it's true that this is uh, this is kind of the way it's depicted oh, Ian McEwan wrote his robot novel or oh, right. Ishiguro yeah. is writing his you know um clone clone you know, novel yeah exactly yeah. but I actually you know having grown up on the the science fiction of the 90s you know Michael Crichton for example right. um you know I then kind of went back and read the original genre fiction when it was taught to me in college and graduate school. And so you read Frankenstein and you're like, the right. origin of the genre is literary. You read H.P. Yes. Wells and you're like, this isn't yes. like Asimov. This is like, you know, so the even Jekyll and Hyde is, and which right. is one of Nabokov's favorite books, you know, yes. the highest literary dude we had, like loved Jekyll and Hyde, you know? So to me, the, 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 the low high uh, genre hierarchy never made sense. Um, and so I really, really, really enjoy just indulging fully in um, all of the affordances of each one. Sort of like a, a, a capitalist invention of the second half of the 20th century to start sort of putting these binaries on yeah. genres. And we have one final question because we are going over. Um, oh, yeah, can, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> can you tell us about your working relationship with your editor, David Ebert? <laughs> he's, uh, he's also been a part of Culture Connection. Oh, David has been a wonderful support and uh, cheerleader for the Furs. He didn't actually work on the Furs as an editor, however. Um, the My press is a US-UK imprint. So I had a British editor, Poppy Hampson, and an American editor, Alexis Washam, who um, bought the book in 2020. Is that right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. And Or maybe 2021 something like that. And then they, each of them left Hogarth, which is, there's a lot of moving around in publishing. Sure. Um, Poppy went to Atlantic um, and Alexis is now a freelance editor. And so then my book was, but my book was, had already been fully edited by then. And so David very kindly adopted it in its last stages of getting out into the world, which is a really important part of an editor's job, right? Sure. Getting the right blurbs, getting the cover right, getting, um, mm -hmm. you know, just getting the right energy around it in the press. And David has just been a, a, a wonderful adoptive father um, to the Furs. And I, I look forward to working with him in the future. That's fantastic. The novel is The Furrow is an Elegy by Namwale Serpel. Namwale, thank you so much for doing this this evening. It's really been a delight. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Brian. A pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Have a good weekend. Be safe.